Let's talk disaccharides. So di means two. We already said saccharides means sugar. So all a disaccharide is is when you take two monosaccharides and stick them together and you get a disaccharide. And you can even kind of look at the space-filled model here and kind of see the individual monosaccharides as how and how they're joined together. And recall that we are going to join these monosaccharides together using a dehydration synthesis reaction. So all we're going to do is take each monosaccharide, take a hydroxyl group off one, a hydrogen group off the other to make water, and ta-da, we get a bond. So here was our maltose example we gave before, and our sucrose example. Both sucrose and maltose are disaccharides. Uh, just a side note, if you have three to a few monosaccharides joined together, they call those oligosaccharides but that's just kind of a side note. We're gonna focus on disaccharides right now. Now, here's where we wanna get into some more detail. What kind of bond is formed when you take these monosaccharides and join them together? So the kind of bond that is formed to make disaccharide carbohydrates are called glycosidic bonds, or they form a glycosidic linkage. And the prefix glyco means sugar, so that's how you can remember that. Let's get into a little more detail about glycosidic linkages because we can categorize those based on which carbons those bonds are attached to. And uh, you might recall before we talked about alpha and beta sugars, and so uh, we're going to include some of that lingo into the terms for our glycosidic bonds as well. Ready? Let's go. Okay, this looks all chemi chemically, doesn't it? It's very cool, but you're gonna be able to decipher this and you're gonna feel so smart for doing it. Okay, so let's look at these glycosidic linkages in more detail. So um, let's go back down to our old examples of maltose and sucrose. And um, recall that we can, in a ring structure, number the carbons from one to however many carbons there are. So in the case of maltose, um, it's created by joining two glucose monomers, monosaccharides together. And recall that if your oxygen is right here on the glucose, then this would be, this little corner here would be carbon number one, two, three, four, five, and six. Now, um, remember that we looked at carbon number one when we were interested in whether it was an alpha or a beta glucose. Hold that thought because that we're gonna come back to that. But let's look at exactly where the glycosidic bond is forming here. So on carbon number one of this glucose, remember that we had a hydroxyl group. And if we go over to this other glucose right here, if we number its carbons, one, two, three, four, five, six. Let's go ahead and label carbon number four. So I'm gonna get out my trusty pen. Okay, so carbon number four is right here. And again, just to, that's supposed to be a circle. And don't forget over here, this carbon right there is carbon number one. So as you can see, we're going to be taking the hydroxyl group off carbon number one of this glucose and the hydrogen off of carbon number four on this glucose to create water. And that forms our glycosidic linkage between the first carbon on this one and the fourth carbon on this one, and thus this glycosidic linkage is called a 1,4 glycosidic linkage because it's between carbon one on one sugar and carbon four on the other. Likewise, let's look at sucrose. Sucrose is made from monomers of glucose and fructose. So just like in the previous example, um, we're gonna take the hydroxyl group off carbon number one on this glucose, but something's a little different on fructose because fructose is a different shaped molecule. And so if we number the carbons on fructose, it actually starts up here with this compound. So this would be carbon one, two, that's supposed to be a two. Oh boy, that's a bad two. Two, three, four, and five. And then the sixth carbon is down here. So don't get confused with glucose because it's a little different. So the important thing is that this carbon right here is number two. And so we're gonna be taking the hydroxyl group off carbon number one of this glucose and, car and the hydrogen off of carbon number two of the fructose to make our water 
and thus our glycosidic bond for sucrose is between one on this carbon and two of this sugar right here. And so this becomes a one, two glycosidic linkage. It's between carbon one on one sugar and carbon two on the other. Easy, right? No biggie right there. It's just whichever carbons you're dealing with is what the name of that linkage is. But we can get a little bit more complicated because we already talked about how monosaccharides can be alpha or beta. And you may recall that it's an alpha linkage if on the glucose, on carbon number one, if hy the hydroxyl group is in an opposite orientation to carbon number six, I kind of like to think of this as like the John Travolta kind of um, label here. So if it's like two, they're in opposite ways, then, um, then that's an alpha sugar. And more like a mousse, like if the hydroxyl group on carbon one is in the same orientation as carbon number six, they're both on the same side, either like this or like this, like moose antlers, then that is a beta. So we can actually do this for disaccharides as well. Um, we can take a look at the orientation of the glycosidic linkage. And so um, in this case, uh, notice that the glucose that made up this first part of the maltose, the hydroxyl group was in the opposite orientation to carbon number six. It was down when carbon six was up, and therefore it was an alpha configuration. So we can actually call this an alpha 1,4 glycosidic linkage. Um, and so if we look over here, um, we can see here that the oxygen that came from the hydroxyl group on the first carbon of this glucose here is in opposite orientation to carbon number six. So this is an alpha 1,4 glycosidic linkage. And uh, in our example um, over here, we see that the glucose that made up the first part of our disaccharide, the hydroxyl group was in the same orientation as carbon number six. It was up when carbon six was up. And so as a result of that, that was a beta configuration, making the disaccharide a beta, in this case, one, four glycosidic linkage. Um, and same thing down here with our sucrose, if we look, um, the hydroxyl group on the glucose was down when carbon six was up. So our sucrose, even though it was a one, two glycosidic linkage, it was also an alpha one, two glycosidic linkage because John Travolta, Saturday night fever, right? Anyway, I hope that made sense. If not, let me know. Okay. Um, so, uh, I think we're good for disaccharides. Let's move on to polysaccharides. So we said a monosaccharide is one sugar, simple sugar. A disaccharide is two. An oligosaccharide is three, two-ish, a few of them. But once you get a whole bunch of these monosaccharides joined together, we call this a polysaccharide because poly means many, many sugars. Um, and so these are used extensively by life forms such as us, such as plants, all sorts of things. Um, and so they come in, uh, these polysaccharides come in many forms and they're very important. Now you might've heard of complex carbs. So when you're talking about things like pasta and bread, which taste yummy, but why do they help make you lose, not lose weight, gain weight <laughs> when you're trying to lose weight? Um, because your body actually has to break up all those monosaccharide components of the polysaccharide. And so your cells can only take in the monosaccharides like glucose and whatever they can't take in, they convert to lipids for long-term energy storage. So we can say that polysaccharides are for storage and they're also for structure, depending on what kind you're talking about. So we're gonna get into some details about some of these examples. Uh, we're gonna talk about the polysaccharide starch. Um, so for example, the kind of polysaccharide that is in potatoes and it's really cool if uh, you get a chance in the lab, you can take a little slice of a potato and you stain it with iodine and it will turn starch dark, like a blackish brown color. And under a microscope, you can actually see these little starch granules, which is where the plant stores its starch. It's, it's really cool. Uh, for we animals, we like to use glycogen and we'll go into more details about these. And um, 
For structural things like insects and their cousins, uh, crabs, lobsters, shrimp, um, their shells, their exoskeletons are made out of a polysaccharide called chitin. Um, so let's take a little bit of a deeper look here. Um, so taking starch, glycogen, and uh, let's talk about another polysaccharide called cellulose, which um, helps make up plant cell walls. If we look at the structures of these things, it's pretty cool. So let's start with starch. A uh, starch is the form of the polysaccharide that plants like to use. And uh, like potato plants, like potatoes, like Mr. Potato Head right here. And um, here are your starch granules. Uh, this particular picture shows them under an electron microscope, which is really awesome. But if you are actually taking them down to the biochemical level, uh, you're going to find a very interesting structure. So again, like any polysaccharides, starch is made up of chains of monosaccharides, um, particularly glucose in this case. And uh, two examples are amylose and amylopectin. And there's very slight differences between these two. They're both poly polymers of glucose, but the actual structure of the compound slightly differs. Um, amylose is unbranched. It just has basically glucose, 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 glucose without any side chains. Um, amylopectin might have some branching in it, so it looks a little bit more like this. Um, now what's cool here is if you look back at the glycosidic linkages between the glucose molecules, uh, you'll be able to recognize, hopefully by now, that these um, glucoses are attached to each other by alpha-1,4 linkages. Um, and this is important because the way the glycosidic bonds form between monomers influences how the whole structure of the polysaccharide is going to appear. So in this case of starch, uh, because of these linkages, it causes the whole molecule to twist up. And so it forms a helical shape. So starch is helical, and you can see that in this picture right here. Uh, if we go down to glycogen, again, this is the storage polysaccharide for animals, such as us. And uh, this is found in our liver. And when your blood sugar gets really low, uh, your pancreas will play a role in telling your liver to start breaking down glycogen. And because glycogen is also made of chains of glucose, it releases glucose into your bloodstream and causes your blood sugar to rise. Uh, but anyway, so we do release this um, in the form of broken down glucose. So we're constantly breaking these bonds. And if you look at the whole structure of glycogen, which is kind of cool, it has a lot of branching here. So it's made up of the same stuff as starch, but the way that it's put together is different. Um, and so we store it in our liver. You can also store glycogen in your muscle cells. Now cellulose is of course a plant product. Uh, we humans cannot actually digest cellulose ourselves, which is why we depend on gut bacteria to help us break it down. And um, of course, if you've been sick and took antibiotics, you might find that those antibiotics didn't just kill the bad bacteria. They might have killed the good bacteria in your gut too, which is why often a side effect of taking strong antibiotics is eh, the creeping crud. Anyway, on that pleasant thought. Um, what's cool is take a look at the difference in glycosidic bonds between starch and cellulose. So we said starch has um, uses alpha-1,4 linkages of glucose. Cellulose uses beta-1,4 linkages of glucose. And you'll remember, this is just a difference between uh, what the orientation of the hydroxyl group was to the sixth on um, carbon one to the sixth carbon on, on the glucose. And so in the case of beta, um, you know, the hydroxyl group on carbon one is in the same orientation as carbon six. And this causes a beta-1,4 glycosidic linkage. And as a result of that different, um, glycosidic linkage pattern, instead of having a helical shape to the molecule, like in starch, it causes straight chains of glucose. And what's cool is between each straight chain that forms, you can get hydrogen bonds, and thus this sort of causes like a patchwork or like a, a netting of cellulose to occur. And so that gives the strength to the cell walls of plants because cellulose is a primary component of plant cell walls. And if it wasn't for that, we'd be in trouble because we do depend on plants, right? Um, we animals depend on plants. So uh, those are just some more details about those three very common examples in life 
of, of polysaccharide. Okay, so we are done with carbs for today, and now we are ready to go on to lipids.